today's Rankled Engineered podcast, Tim joins us again as the overlord of pronunciation. We'll discuss risk category three buildings and the thresholds that trigger that requirement. We're going to discuss a product that uses transportation as part of its fabrication. And we'll discuss walking down the Eiffel Tower. Hello, welcome to the Wrinkled Engineer podcast. I'm Gates. I'm here again with Tim and a new guy, Greg. Uh, Greg's a, he's an interesting story uh, because he's a bit of a trader because he is a licensed engineer, but he's a project manager. Guilty. <laughs> but we need his expertise here today as a, as a project manager and somebody who has decided to get in bed with contractors. We're okay with that. He's, he's a good guy. He knows a lot. So this will be, this will be fun. Um, I think we have a, we have a topic where we don't agree with it. We know we're defeated, but we're going to talk about it just because <laughs> it annoys us. Um, and before we get into our code topic, which we're going to talk about risk category three buildings and the thresholds that cause you to go into that. And then some of the secondary and tertiary consequences that are a result of having to upgrade a building to risk category three. Uh, Tim, our overlord of pronunciation, ruined a word for Greg. And <laughs> it wasn't because of the pronunciation, although you could go a couple ways with this word. He, he destroyed it for Greg. So Greg, what word did Tim just ruin for you? Uh, the word, and I, was, and I was just telling my wife about this, but the word verbiage uh, is now um, forever ruined for me because I hear it all the time. And now I know better how to use it. Uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Tim and, and to yourself because you were part of that that uh, part of the grammar that Nazis. awakening. <laughs> so oh, Tim, what's wrong with with verbiage? Or verbiage? We used to hear it in in meetings all the time. Well, first of all, the word is verbiage and not verbiage, but because um, verbiage, it turns out, isn't a word. Um, verbiage, by by dictionary definition, means like. Uh, um, excessive or, you know, redundant or, or, or unnecessary language. And uh, it was most often used when I, whenever I heard it in meetings uh, as meaning just, just the, uh, the language or the wording of something. Like we need to add, we need to add language regarding, you know, putting in this material or something like that. And they always use the word verbiage instead. And uh, uh, really, like I said, if if it's just swapped out one to one with language, it's basically going to work every time. So yeah, yeah it's, hopefully that makes <laughs> makes the transition <laughs> smoother. <laughs> it, and, and, I, and as I started to think about that definition and usage of the word, it's like I couldn't find a place to really use it organically in my speech. <laughs> so I just use language now for almost everything. Unless yeah, it's, it's like really when is. you yeah. when you read a contract that's just really overwritten, that's yeah. when you're really talking about verbiage. And that's yeah, lawyers and legalese, that's when I figure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the code. Maybe there's a few things in the code that are a bit redundant. <laughs> yeah. But it, it gets used all the time and every time I hear it now, I just I, I almost cringe, you know, and, and whether it's my <laughs> boss or, or another director and they say it, it's just like, Oh, come on, let's let's go to grammar school with uh, with Tim and Gates for a minute here. We'll educate everybody. <laughs> <laughs> totally works. Um, but Tim is the man. I'm, I just am a follower. I'm a true believer in Tim. Um, <laughs> all right. So risk category three buildings. Yes. Um, this came about. So the background that, of how this came about is working on several projects that were renovations. And they were renovations to that did not change the occupancy. So if it was a restaurant, it was going to be a restaurant. Like if it was a retail store, it was going to be a retail store after the renovation. Um, so the changes were permitted, but there was no change in occupancy. So there wasn't a comprehensive evaluation of the building. Just the changes were looked at. And our jurisdiction having authority said, oh, well, but this is a risk category three building because of the occupant load on the building. And so you're touching it, you're buying it. Now you got to upgrade the lateral system where the primary impact was because there wasn't a snow load concern, uh, which is 
hard to swallow. Um, so Greg, being somebody who works with the owner's dollars, but much more than a normal engineer, what does that do to you in a project <laughs> when you're going in to do just a renovation? Well, <clears throat> it's kind of like a blind side. I mean, especially when you've come in and, and most you know, owners, most clients, especially anybody who doesn't have any technical information, you know, they, they just don't understand the why, right? And and even after you explain and say, well, that you know, the city or or the you know the JHA as we say is 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 forcing us to do this, they don't understand why. Because like you said, well, I'm not changing it. I was a restaurant and now I'm a restaurant, or you know, I'm a I'm an office and I'm still an office, um, or you know, whatever the whatever that that use is, you know, they want to go in and they're, they're expecting to say, and, and basically put the bulk of their dollars, you know, usually on the finishes, uh, maybe on some equipment or some, some minor infrastructure, you know, like if, if you're renovating the kitchen part uh, of a restaurant, cause we, I know we're kind of going with the restaurant here and, and that's hard to, to educate. And usually, um, usually you're not catching it early on because, uh, you know, if you're doing, uh, an, an original assessment, or you're some estimates on the project and you're trying to understand what your, you know, what, what's the cost to, that we can do, right? What's our capital investment that we can understand we can take on and then figure out then what the return on investment is, right? Because anytime you're doing a renovation like that, um, you're looking for some kind of uh, rate, you know, rate of return, return on investment. And, and now if you're thinking that you're kind of going from walls out and maybe you're adding a couple walls or, or removing just a few walls, um, and you've got to get into the whole lateral system, which could be, you know, all exterior walls, could be footings. Um, it, it really takes a toll on your budget, and it and it it's definitely going to make your finance person, uh, your finance accountant, you know, cringe uh, when you got to ask for that more money or say, hey, is this still worth it now? You know, and then you, you know, you got a couple options from there, right? You can either go down the VE right. Um, and see, okay, what can we cut scope so we can incorporate the cost for this? Uh, and a lot of them, they want to go back and say, well, you know, how, how do we avoid then going to the city with this? Or how do we avoid this trigger, right? What what scope? And that's something that I see all the time is, okay, how can we modify the scope then so I don't have to go get a building permit, right? Um, and that's a tough that's a tough spot because depending on your initial intent, you may not be able to do that. Um, you know, it just depends on what the goal is of the project. Absolutely. So it doesn't sound fun to hit this trigger. And the trigger that we were specifically hitting was these were larger restaurants with more than 300 people. A restaurant architecturally is classified as an assembly type structure. And when you hit that 300 people threshold, you are now kicked into this risk category three building. We also so, ran into it when we were trying to convert some uh, retail space into restaurant space. Because yep. now, in, now you're changing a couple of areas. Right. right. Uh, but it was always that. But the funny thing of, is, we weren't changing the number of people. You know, it, it's uh, it's still going to be the same number of people, whether it was a crowded it store or a, or a restaurant that's fully seated. You know, so it was just always this thought that. Are the people somehow like the the value of their lives are suddenly elevated because they they ordered appetizers as opposed to simply browsing racks? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just seemed really like just lacked any kind of logic. Yeah, and, and so as we met this challenge and we're trying to figure out what was going on, the world seemed to be turning upside down on us. Uh, we reached out. I reached out to several of my colleagues and I got really interesting responses that surprised me. I, I thought everybody saw the world like I do, right? I mean, clearly yeah. this, <laughs> this category three is this certain kind of building and these are all just normal risk category two buildings. Uh, and what I saw and, and what I pieced together was this pattern that the mentality had changed over the years. Go back 20 years and it was really clear that you had to have special conditions that you were gonna be a risk category three or four building Everything else was a two, uh, but then some of the language in the code got kind of confused and people started to err on the side of caution and started to move to risk category three. But the resounding result I got was risk category three is no big deal on a new building. I don't even care if it's risk category two or three, but on a renovation, yes, it's not, 
the money is not worth the gain that we're getting with with the safety. And so that started to put some of these pieces together. And so a quick background, we assume most of you that are going to listen to this or <laughs> care about this type of topic. Um, risk category one through four is generally what we deal with. Risk category two being the, the baseline, and then you adjust from there with risk category one being unoccupied structures, which means one person like once a day. So if it's a storage facility, you're probably fine. If it's an agricultural facility that just has animals, you're fine. If it's a tractor storage facility where you have at least somebody in there twice a day, it's no longer a risk category one building. Um, risk category three is the step up from a risk category two where you need a little bit more resilience and a little bit more fat in your design. And then a risk category four, we all know is an essential facility. That thing's got to work and operate during and after an event and keep those people not only safe, but functional. And I think Tim and I were talking about this. The issue is, is risk category two unsafe, Tim? Is that That's the premise? The thing is if, if the code is designed such that 98, 99% of buildings are risk category two, then how can we suddenly say that it's unsafe for, and this, this is the, the thing that I always use for it, an olive garden. So <laughs> we're building a new olive garden. It, it's got, you know, 325 people in there all together. And suddenly that's some sort of a, uh, an at-risk facility where people need to be extra protected in this building more so than they do in the 98 or 99% of buildings that they're in the rest of their lives. It's right. just r really odd, and so including I, like a mall, for example. I mean, uh, uh, a full-size regional mall would be designed as a Category 2 building, but then Olive Garden would be a Category 3. Like, what? <laughs> it, 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 so it's interesting on this uh, how it's like this. It's just all over the place. And you yeah. know, if you're down one path, suddenly you're triggering things. And in my mind, the original intent of the risk categories were two is everything else, which we, we talked about, and it will keep you safe during an event, a design level event. That structure may not be usable after the event. It may require some major repairs after a design level earthquake or you know hurricane wind loads or those kinds of things. Risk category three building should maintain partial functionality, but be able to be easily brought back online. So maybe broken windows or something along those lines that you can repair to be working again relatively quickly after an event. And a lot of the requirements for category three, if you read through them, are, are hazardous materials. Yep. Where and then, the failure of the building will result in, you know, a dangerous mix of materials or explosions or something like that. And that's why you want the building to stand. Absolutely. And so risk category four goes into functioning throughout and it can't have any downtime. And then the other thing is Tim alluded to. So we have, we're concerned with the occupants of the building and immediately on that property and the liability of a structural failure and, and performance for that owner. Then there's the other triggers I see that were at the initial founding of this, this mythology or this philosophy is if you have something that poses hazard to the rest of the community beyond your property, you have an obligation to protect that. So that is hazmat type of things. Um, power generation and those types of things that we rely on in the public um, for a normal life or not even just normal, but really basic health and safety. Those things have to be designed to a higher quantity because we need them to run during the event and after the event. And so it, it turned into, and storm shelters are different ball game in and of themselves and they're completely different criteria and they're not governed by the building code. Uh, so, it's not about sheltering people. It's about keeping people safe that are just the normal occupants of that building in enough that when the event's over, they can egress and, and be okay. And now it seems to have gotten fuzzy. Um, so a brief primer for risk category three buildings, the snow loads increased by 10%, seismic loads are increased by 25%, and the wind speed is increased you know, 10, 15 miles an hour, which is not a huge percentage increase. And then risk category four, you get a 20% increase in wind and snow, 50% increase in seismic, which is definitely substantial if you're in the West Coast. Um, and then again, the wind speed goes up probably 10 or 12% as it jumps up about 20 or 30 miles an hour. Uh, Greg, 25% increase in structural loads on a new building. 
So foundations will say get 25% bigger and your steel gets, we'll just say 25% heavier. What kind of percentage impact does that have on the structure? Or the, well, the overall building cost? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, d depending on the, the materials used, right? You're going to be around that same level because, you know, steel is something that's often uh, estimated and quoted, you know, per pound, right? So yeah, if my, if my steel needs to be 25% more uh, because of that, um, and, and maybe it's probably not, you know, straight one for one, because you can use a different shape or a little bit different configuration to help you get that strength. But um, you're, you're going to be looking, uh, I'll, I'll say dollar for dollar um, on that. But it's it's not going to be as big of an impound be, uh, impact because you're you a new build, right? You're already talking uh, probably several million, maybe you know, depending on the facility. If you're if you're doing something large enough that's going to have 300 people, um, percentage wise overall on the project, you're 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 not looking that much, right? And and there's obviously a lot of variations in that, but maybe it's only five percent, maybe it's ten percent uh, if you can do it efficiently. Um, but I think where it really is going to hurt is is on that remodel. Uh, because one, you, you know, you're not, it's not like you're already building the wall and you just got to do uh, a little heavier steel or some extra studs, uh, your spacing, you know, drops down. Um, it, now you're, now you're opening a wall that you weren't even touching or you're getting into a footing that you weren't even touching. And those are all brand new costs on a renovation. It's, it's brand new scope and special. And what really worries me, uh, is, is if my strength needs to be that much stronger, right. And especially in lateral often then you, you end up designing your way out uh, of a wood, you know, some kind of wood or, or maybe even concrete. And now you're going to steel. And so you're introducing a new trade. Um, and that new trade could have, it'll definitely have cost impacts because you're bringing on a brand new sub. Um, and that sub's got overhead to, to pay for his time and, and his, you know, time on the job. Um, but you're, you could also impact your schedule, you know, especially with steel. A lot of the steel is, is longer lead it's you know i can't just go down to my local uh, building supply store and order you know the next heavy gauge uh light uh, light gauge steel or or you know a few more of it right now i'm now i'm doing something that i need to have an exact measurements and i've got to shop fab this stuff this steel um and it's going to come from you know could come from a couple states over because that's where uh it's, it's not something that's locally available and so then with schedule now you're talking even more dollars and so it, it it could jump it up tremendously and and you know percentage wise it just depends on what your original scope is but you know it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me on certain jobs where you may end up doubling you know your cost because of what you were originally planning to do versus what you're doing now because all those original costs there for your finishes um your lighting maybe and maybe some you know some new kitchen equipment or other equipment those are all still going to happen but now you you just increased all of those because now you got to do more finishes on these new walls that i just opened up maybe now i'm doing exterior you know stucco or some other uh you know siding material that uh, because i got to the, get to the exterior to reinforce uh you know so that exterior wall very invasive process process mm -hmm. It'll kill projects, you know. I mean, if it, they could say, we just can't do this, and that'll just be the end of it. We have to leave everything as it is. Yeah, and when you're doing new design, it's easy to move up a couple beam sizes, a few beam weights. But when that steel exists, now it's a Band-Aid. You're, you're trying to reinforce existing steel. It's very inefficient, and it's very costly. Um, so I want to get into the triggers for this that really have impacted us and why this is now a problem. Uh, so from ASCE 7 and a combination of ICC, um, the IBC documents, what it comes down to is more than 300 people that congregate in one area. Uh, daycare facilities with more than 150, elementary and high schools with 250, and colleges with 500, healthcare with more than 50, and then like jails and prisons. We're going to ignore the bottom of that list because, yeah, we're, we're not going to argue that schools need to be to a higher standard or that prisons or that, you know, healthcare facilities have lower thresholds. It's the more than 300 people congregate in one area. That was from ASC 705. Um, in the 2015 IBC, where this table is kind of recreated, uh, the wording is primary occupancy is public assembly more than 300 people, but it does not say group A. In one area. In one area. It or does not say group A. Right. Um, 
where when you get to the other facilities where we're talking about uh, education, it says it explicitly states group E or group I. There are a few spots in the code where I get frustrated with some ambiguity that exists where within one section, one kind of language is used and then a different kind of language is used. So here we have, you're telling me the description of an assembly area, but you're not saying group A. In the other ones, you're not telling me it's an education facility, you're telling me it's group E. So am I to infer that this assembly is really not group A? That's not the trigger? Or is it, is it something else? Or am I to infer that it is group A? Uh, so I dug deeper on this because we figured out where the confusion lies. Architects call specific types of building assembly. They're assembly occupancies. Structural engineers have a completely definition for what an assembly criteria would be. Tim, what would be more a structural definition of assembly? <laughs> what are we looking at? What kind of buildings are we looking at? Um, when, whenever I've thought about how that kind of thing was targeted, it was supposed to be towards uh, where, where the failure of localized and interrelated structural elements would result in the injury or death of 300 people, such as a balcony collapsing in a theater, um, a, uh, a, a very large truss that spans a very crowded area, that kind of thing. But, you know, the, you can have collapses in buildings that are unrelated structurally to other things in the building. And for some reason, they're summing up the total population of the building even though it's impossible that one thing should affect another. So, you know, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem correct. And, and uh, I guess, I guess I'll kind of get into that with my, with my strip mall analogy that I have yes. teed up for you. So <laughs> I view it uh, simply it's, it's a risk versus number of people type of scenario. Um, and density of people plays a huge role into that. Uh, the commentary of ASCE seven gives like two or three examples, but it's like lecture halls, um, auditoriums, and uh, a couple others where when I see that in my mind, it's like, oh, that is people just sardine canned, three right. square foot As per many person. people as you can fit per square foot. Mm -hmm. yeah, not, you know, bars would be more crowded than an Olive Garden restaurant where you've got a six foot diameter table with eight people around it. And they're all sharing in, you know, with five or six or eight square feet a person. Uh, so to me that, that density is one thing is if something were to fail, is it impacting an in a very large number of people given the area? Um, and then I also think you have to look at, as Tim was saying, systems, like you have the overall building. Yes. If you, when there's a trigger in there, when you get up over, um, you know, like a thousand people, you automatically go up a risk category, uh, regardless of the occupancy. That makes sense. It's a, it's a significant structure except for. It doesn't make sense if it's a 500,000 square foot warehouse that, you know, it's a, it's an Amazon fulfillment center that has a couple thousand people working in it, but everybody has a square mile of themselves. Why right. would that entire building be, it's not an arena where if the gross building failed, you would kill tens of thousands. It's like those size of warehouses are one building, but structurally they're 12 buildings with all independent lateral systems. <laughs> and so one failure on one portion of the building doesn't lead to the other. Um, so I think you have that gross building uh, classification. And then I think you have the girder and column classification where high load, single elements, what's the impact of that failure? And so maybe it's not so much looking at the building, but saying, is that a more critical element that requires more redundancy than others? And then you can get into Joyce and Perlins and things that shouldn't have a vast impact on the structure. Does that seem reasonable? I think so. Okay, good. I, I want to make sure I'm, you know, it sounds like I'm preaching to the choir on this. Um, <laughs> so I found this interesting, this interesting note in the commentary of ASC 716. And it actually, I think it was repeated in the older versions. Uh, it basically says that there was some ambiguity in the use of the word occupancy category. Um, but it says, however, the term occupancy as okay. used by the building code relates primary to issues associated with fire and life safety. Not structural stability. Not structural performance. 
it deals with the architectural portions of the code. Hence why Egress. Yeah, the architect deals with establishing the occupancy category. And I can totally understand how a restaurant full of tables with 300 people in it and probably only one or two exits could be difficult to get out of in the event of a fire right. or something. But talk to me about an olive garden in a hurricane in Florida <laughs> and why the restaurant would be full in the middle of a category four hurricane. Right, not happening. <laughs> it does not need to be used. There is There is something to be said about the survivability of the infrastructures, restaurants and things for uh, serving the community. Um, and I, after Hurricane Michael up in, in Florida in, in the Panhandle, I was there, did some disa- some disaster assessment and as well as some cleanup activities. Uh, it was nice that there were a few restaurants open uh, within a couple of weeks, but it was like Sonic. And what they did is they brought a trailer with the, the refrigerator and everything and a generator and a propane tank so that they could get their kitchen back online. You know, that, that was all it took. You can mobilize to get restaurants back. They're not critical. A grocery store, gas stations, those kinds of facilities, absolutely. They're more critical than a restaurant. Yeah, but arguably more important, right? Yeah, but yet they're not risk category three buildings. Nope. Um, <laughs> it, this other tidbit from the commentary says that risk category includes, risk category two includes the vast majority of structures. Right. Um, including most residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. Now, I know that maybe a restaurant isn't totally classified as a commercial building. Maybe we're thinking offices, but the vast majority makes it seem to me you really have to prove a justified need to move up into a risk category three or four. That's just me so far. Um, This this led me to reach out. I found a, a paper written in one of the structural magazine or one of the engineering magazines uh and i contacted the author because it was written about 2003 2004 um, and it seemed to be from my point of view that architectural occupancy and structural occupancy are not related they are not keyed together in any way the definitions are different Uh, and of course the ibc doesn't define those terms clearly in both sections um in chapter what four and 16. um so I contacted her and she emailed me back and we ended up having a phone call and she had served on ASCE code committee over occupancy categories and risk risk assessment. And she totally agreed with me. She was like, yes, you're right. This was, this was the way we originally wrote the code. It was intended that these things were separate. She says, but over the last two decades, you know, 15, 16 years, the mentality has changed. People on the committee have changed. She's, you know, the authorities out there have changed, the, the building officials have changed to start to warm up to this idea that a lot more buildings should be in risk category three, which bothers me. It bothers me to have that change just because it makes you feel better and not necessarily because it's it's based on reason and logic. Uh, so Tim, I, I, want, I want your strip mall analogy because I think this really right. proves the point of how difficult it is to... Uh, upgrade a building for risk category three and who's responsible. And it's so easy to trigger in mundane ways that right. nobody would so think th- this of. Was the, this was the interpretation I came up with. Um, if you have a strip mall that has seven bays in it and three of them are shops and, and three of them are, you know, little cafe restauranty kind of things. And the seventh one uh, I need, needed one to be on the fulcrum, basically. <laughs> the seventh one is like a, a coffee house. That would make four mercantiles and three assemblies, and then the building would be a category two under that definition. But if the people who owned that coffee shop decided that instead of handing you the muffin at the counter, they were going to bring it to the table for you and set it on the table, that triggers the upgrade of the entire shopping center to a risk category three and just, just that one activity. <laughs> and it's, it's just, it, it just demonstrates how, how illogical it is in, in terms of now, now suddenly everybody in the entire shopping center, because somebody's being brought a muffin <laughs> instead of just having it <laughs> handed to them across the counter, suddenly yes. that, that triggers upgrading the entire facility. And who pays for the rest of the facility? Is it all the owners? Right. Is it the owner making the change? 
uh, it does seem absurd in a lot of these cases. And I think we've gone away from the original intent of, of having risk categories. Um, one of the things that bothers me. So the trigger is to be in an assembly building is if more than 50% of the area is assembly, then it gets treated this way. Uh, so I can have an auditorium that has a, a you know a few hundred people in it inside of a large building that the rest of it is just offices or things like that. And that facility now only has 20% of its area assembly. So structurally it's a risk category two building. But I could have some girders that could fail in that space and kill a lot of people. Yeah. It seems like that space, again, going back to my original point, should be given more special care. And that's, again, this is doesn't relate to how the architects use the space. It doesn't relate to how they define their egress paths. Because evacuating a bunch of people from one auditorium into a less dense, dense populated space is easier on the fire code to get them out of the building than it is from a structural point of view to protect those people in place. Um, so... I said at the beginning, we've, we've kind of resigned ourselves that the community has moved on to this new definition and we, we deal with it. We, we do what the, the jurisdictions tell us to do. Um, we, we contest it as much as we feel like is prudent. Um, it's just a complaint we have. Uh, in ASC 716, um, in 1.5.1, 1. uh, the committee decided to punt on this topic. Uh, they state that uh, occupancy category um, in the commentary, like I said, is they're disassociated. Arch architectural occupancy and structural occupancy are not the same. But then they go ahead and say in the code that the risk category, speaking structurally, shall not be taken as lower than the occupancy category stated by the building code, which would be the architect's purview. So the architects can call it, uh, you know, whatever they rate it, our occupancy classification has to be equivalent or higher. So again, structural engineers were required to be more conservative than our, our counterparts. And uh, so if they call it assembly, you have to design it like it's an assembly space structurally, even though that's not the code intent. And I think it's sad and it's costing people lots of money as Greg can attest. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's. I mean, as we've just been talking this, you know, these examples that I've worked on and, and stuff over the past has come to mind. It's like, man, if I had to go back to that guy who, you know, was already at his bare minimum of rate of return and, and what he wanted to invest on the job and said, hey, uh, by the way, I'm going to need another half a million dollars because I got to retrofit the exterior of the walls. And he just would have thrown his hands up in frustration and and, you know, not, not even to know what to do at that point. And so it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, we've put this, we've put this unknown out there, right? Because like you've kind of mentioned, it, it is a little bit vague. And so it's hard for anybody to understand and go with the mindset of like, okay, well, we, we think we're, we're, we're doing the right thing, right? Everybody, nobody goes in with the tent of how do I cheat the building code system here? Because everybody wants to reduce their liability, every, you know, every land uh, owner, property owner wants to, you know, not have any liability claims against them. Um, and so they're trying to go in with, with what the most logical, what the most uh, safe approach is. Um, so that way they can have a, a successful business and, and operating. And, and especially if you're the, if you're the landlord of that, of that strip ball, and let's say you're, you're building a brand new one. And how do you, how do you try to control your cost? Even if it's brand new, right? We, we mentioned it wasn't that much, but if you're talking, you know, 10% on that brand new building because you don't know what your future tenants are going to be doing. Um, you know, how do you, you got to make that risk, like the assessment on yourself and that choice of whether you're going to, you know, tell your engineer to say, Hey, reside on the safe side or, you know, Hey, let's toe the line down to what we, what we think uh, risk category two should be and keep our, our build cost low. Right. And uh, difficulty with this too is on the front end, if you go into a jurisdiction and say, hey, is this a risk category two or a risk category three building? You know what they're going to say, right? They're gonna, Oh, it's risk category it's three. It's nothing because, to them. Yeah, because it's already you put it on the table. But then you design, if you don't do that, if you don't get upfront confirmation from the, the building official what they're going to rate this building as, you're going to design as risk category two, and it's going to get rejected with a redesign to 
because they want his risk category three. You know, there's just no win situation because um, designing it as a risk category three just because you know it'll work is not a that's not a win. Uh, so I, I, you know, it's one of those things. It's just one of those things that we deal with. Um, any other thoughts on or if we beat this horse? No, I think we're there. <laughs> All right, I want to talk about something fun. So uh, I like to ask Tim questions and uh, <laughs> pose pose interesting things. And so one of those is, what products are there that as part of their fabrication time utilize transport as part of that process? And, and so we've thrown back a few things on a, on a fun list. And I think we're going to go back to one of the older ones that, that's got an, at least an interesting history. And a lot of people know about this history, but... What product do you think, Tim, is interesting for using transportation as fabrication? IPAs. Yep. So why, <laughs> I mean, I thought that was kind of a modern resurgence of a drink. What? What's the big deal? It was. We just got all like, you know, it's sort of like the whole hipster thing where everybody starts getting into analog stuff and old stuff. And they're like, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> no. <laughs> We shouldn't even be drinking IPAs. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> India Pale Ale, right? I mean, is it is it right. ale from India? Right, India India Pale Ale, meaning a pale ale that's made in Great Britain and destined for India. And the entire principle was, beer goes bad on that long of a trip, um, with hot weather and things like that. So. How do we fix it? Well, we we put more hops in it to help kill the bacteria. So, you know, we, we hop the hell out of it basically. And uh, that gets kind of consumed over the course of the trip so that it tastes, you know, reasonably more normal by the time it gets there. And the way that that people are drinking it today is basically like right out of the factory kind of thing as it was never drunk before <laughs> like they they never it's like no that's like drinking cake batter it's like an unfinished product <laughs> that doesn't sound know? too bad cake batter's good <laughs> <laughs> but it like it wasn't it wasn't the purpose and and yet we're, we're just all about it and uh so so that's that's my example <laughs> yeah it's, it's a fascinating history for something that for just beer but the idea that we have this really long travel time and we don't have refrigeration. So how do we handle it? It's still going to be active mm -hmm. and it's still going to be doing what it does in the fermentation process. So if we send it out early and tweak the formula so it can handle the, the turbulence of the sea and the temperature changes, because you got to think that ship, crosses the, yeah, that, that ship crosses the equator twice, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And it goes into the polar region. <laughs> so talk about some thermal stresses there on, That's on your crazy. beer. And, you know, that's what they did to make it tolerable. And it's quite the endeavor. Uh, so that, to me, that's one of those interesting things. Um, so I wanted to, to close uh, on something as a structural engineer that I just, I had this experience, oh, 16, 17 years ago, uh, to go to Paris and, and spend some time there. And of course, as a structural engineer, you got to go to the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and so I, my, my suggestion to anybody who's going to the Eiffel Tower um, take the elevator, go to the second deck, and then go up to the observation platform on the third level. But when you come down off the Eiffel Tower and you make the transition off the elevator at deck two, walk down the stairs. It's really easy. I mean, it's long. It's still, what, 400, 500 feet of elevation change. Uh, but you're going downhill, so it's, it's, not, a, it's not a problem. But the it's staircase winds through the leg you know, one of the legs of the Eiffel Tower. And it gives you this perspective of this absolutely huge steel structure. And as Tim likes to call them, it's it's an honest or authentic structure. Yeah. Why is that, Tim? Why is the Eiffel Tower like the quintessential authentic structure? Because, because well, almost all of it, the structure that you see is actually doing all the work. And uh, there's no drywall, there's no stucco, there's no stone facing on it, anything like that, you know, it's just, it is what it is. <laughs> it's, right, uh, and it, it, it serves, um, it's very efficient, right? This is lattice structure, yeah. hot riveted. Um, it's just gorgeous to see 
Um, it's lightweight. It's a thousand feet tall. It was the tallest building in the world when it was built. It exerts the same amount of pressure on the ground as a person sitting in a chair. And it's just amazing that that's even possible, you know? Yeah, it's, um, it's just an engineering marvel. It's not pretty, but for structural engineers, it's gorgeous. How dare you? I know, yeah. From a structural engineer, <laughs> it's, it's a gorgeous building. Uh, and it serves very little function at least initially <laughs> yep just for looking around looking looking at and well it was a it was a demonstration of technological prowess for the french it was it was all about look what we can do you know obviously this you were meant to see the applications of the technology when you looked at it was it, it wasn't the last... supposed to be a thing unto itself so much as it was a demonstration piece was it the last demonstration of technology from the french <laughs> <laughs> never <laughs> never thought that out but <laughs> sorry i couldn't couldn't let that one slide uh, also <laughs> do it if you're going to be in paris and you're going to go to the eiffel tower walk walk the stairs you'll you won't regret it i had a video of it that i shot on a very old camera but i i can't couldn't find it the other thing i did that day was i went into the catacombs so i felt like i saw the bottom and the top of paris all in one day <laughs> got to feel like indiana jones um, very cool experiences. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't trade those for anything. They were it was awesome to to be there. Um, well, Tim, Greg, thank you for joining me. I, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you. you guys, anything you want to add in closing? No. Uh, yeah, I, nope, I got I'm it good. out. I've been. I enjoyed I enjoyed the discussion with you guys as always. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys have a good evening and uh, we'll get back to you soon. Again, this is The Wrinkled Engineer. I hope you enjoy our podcast. You can catch us on, on LinkedIn and Instagram and YouTube and all that fun stuff. So hit us up, subscribe, and leave your comments. We all want to hear what you have to say. So have a good one. We'll see you later.